hey folks welcome back to the channel i hope you have a great time wherever you are in the previous episode of uh, how to build an editor with emacs list we discussed the basic rules and laws of any list we discussed how like we learned how to define a function how to call a function we learned about uh, variables um, environments scopes and uh, things like that to continue our journey uh, in today's episode we're going to talk about conditionals this would be another step toward gaining the bare minimum knowledge of ELISP in order to create our own uh, editor. But before we can talk about conditionals, we have to talk about the concept of truth in ELISP and establish what's true and what's not. Like any other programming language, ELISP has uh, true uh, and false. Actually, it doesn't have a false uh, keyword. So t the symbol t in elisp is equal uh, equivalent to true in other languages so we don't have any keyword true we just have symbol t which is true right and as i mentioned there's no such thing as false in like a keyword false in um, elisp we have near right so it's either uh, we have only t and near T is true, nil is false, right? And in nil is anything beside nil considered to be true. So when when we use anything as a like a condition of a, like a conditional, if it evaluates to anything beside nil, it's true. Otherwise, like nil is the only one which is false, right? And if I evaluate nil, you can see that it returns nil. But what about false? There's no such variable as false. Or if t is true, what about f? Again, no variable as f. So as you can see, we only have two. t, which is true in other programming languages, and nil that in some pro like in Python it's none in some other programming languages it's null uh, right the concept of nil is like none but that like nil is the only value that is false if you if you use nil in uh, in a conditional it evaluates to a, like like it considered to be false right so now we know what's true and uh, what's uh, false Let's talk about uh, conditionals. I put a bullet point here for uh, to talk about let and uh, proc family, but kind of I have to talk about if first, and I get to that uh, in a second. Um, but conditional special forms. Um, if you recall from the previous episode, we talk uh, we talked about the special forms and why we call them special forms. So basically, if you remember when we um, when we discussed how about, like when we discussed the list evaluation rules, uh, we said that on a function call, what happens is elisp is going to take the first element as a function, like it evaluates the first element uh, element obviously, and the return value of the result of the evaluation has to be a function, and then uh evaluates the rest of the elements of a list and pass it to the first function to the function as the parameters right and we have some forms like some of uh like if when unless count or some other uh forms that doesn't follow the same evaluation rules that's why we call them special forms right so you'll see it in a bit why it's different i i just created a, like a random elisp file right so the form of an if uh, expression in elisp is like uh, the first the first element of the list is if obviously the second element would has to be like a condition or any expression uh, like any exp obviously we can write any expression in the condition section like as the second element but it it will be used as the condition right and a then uh, expression and else expression. I put three dots here. Uh, 
uh, three dots might not be a, a good idea. Let's do else experience like a um, multiple expressions, right? So what happens is unlike function calls, since if is a special form, what happens here, Elisp actually try to evaluate the condition. It, 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 obviously everything in uh, Lisp is an expression. So this condition is an expression. It evaluates it based on the rules that we discussed in the last episode. And depends on uh, the evaluation, uh, like, depends on what condi the condition expression evaluates to it decide which one of these two to uh, one of, which one of these two expressions to evaluate right if condition evaluates to anything beside nil it's going to if it's going to uh, evaluate the then expression but if condition evaluates to nil then if is going to actually um evaluate the else expressions. I said multiple else expressions because uh, you can like, I'll show you, I'll, I'll show you in a second, but basically it would be something like this, right? Here, this number one is actually the then expression and the rest are else expressions. So let's go and evaluate this one as you can see it returns number four if is if on its own is an expression as well right everything is in e lisp and in any lisp uh everything is uh, expressions right so whenever we evaluate uh, evaluate an expression we get a value back in case of if since our condition is nil, obviously it's going to go with the S uh, expressions and it returns the final, the result of evaluation of the final expression, which in this case is number four, numbers evaluate to themselves. So we expect number four as the return value, as you can see. But um, let's, let's go with the, like a, a success case as well. So if we have the same if, but change the condition to be true, as you can see, we get number one back. So um, one thing to consider here is that like we have only one then expression, but whatever we write here, like we, we can write so many expressions here and all of them would be part of the else expression. So if I run this one, we get number five back, but if we look at the message buffer, as you can see, we have this random string I used. So what's happening is in the nil case, Elisp actually evaluates the entire else expressions and message being one of them gets evaluated and prints out this thing uh to the message log and finally since five is the last uh, expression we get it back as the return value of the entire if so that's how if works and by the way i might be wrong uh i i actually couldn't uh like i tried to google it before i start recording i couldn't find anything but i remember i read somewhere that the notion of if like the way if works basically in uh, programming languages uh, comes from uh, the first the very first implementation of Lisp like uh, when John McCarthy actually created the first Lisp if comes from uh, that time basically I might be wrong but the notion of uh, branching in the control flow, flow uh, comes from the very first list. I might be wrong, but I think I read it somewhere. I'm not sure. Um, and that's kind of ex uh, exciting to me. You know, <laughs> if it wasn't because of that list, who knows uh, what, like, what other option uh, or what other solution we would have used today. Um, yeah, that's how if works. But you might ask the question that uh, what if I want to run more expressions as part of this then here? Like, how can I do that? Right. 
so there's like plenty of other uh, ways to do it but there's like two common ways to like two common patterns you see uh, whenever you read any elisp code one is uh, three actually one is obviously to define whatever you want here in a function and do the function call here like to define a function called like fun blah and i don't know one two three three expressions ah, that's not a good example let's do let's say it's here and then fun x and add x as a part right we learned about it in a previous episode we can just easily here say blah right since the condition is nil uh, it's not going to get evaluated but we have like two expressions in the function that's one way uh, the other way is to use let we didn't uh, we didn't discuss it in the previous episode uh, but let's do it today because it's such an important part of uh, we're going to get uh, use let quite a lot so how let work basically if you remember from the previous episode every when we define a function using def var um def var or set queue right when we use these two uh to define a variable in elisp the variable that we define is a global variable uh if you can't remember uh, about these two please uh watch the previous episode again um but the main important thing here to remember is that like defvar and setq define global variables so if you're used to other programming languages like javascript uh, python or whatever you you're used to seeing something like this in case of python right to have a function and then uh, sorry to have a function and in your function you have you you would be like a equals to like a value or whatever thinking that okay this a variable is local to my function so it exists only in the context of my function while that's true in other programming languages in lisp that's not the case in lisp if you use def var even in a function so for example if i do we have a function here if i do something like this here like def for for set queue is most more common you see it more commonly if you see something like this not x let's say two if you see something like this it doesn't mean that you define the local variable foo after this point in time the variable foo is defined in your global scope and I see that uh, like I, I see this pattern from many people I used to do it when I when I learned Lisp like I use the uh, um, I use it but I learned this by a scheme I uh, there's a, like a keyword called define which is like the same as def bar I used to use define in my functions quite a lot <laughs> quite a lot on uh, until um, a friend of mine who's a Lisper he saw my mistake and <laughs> He burst into here tears um uh, anyway like this is the wrong thing i see from the um, newcomers in lisp don't do it if you if you want to define a local variable the way to do it is to use let or any other variant of let i'm going to talk about one today so how let works it gets like a list of bindings and then body right so the list of binding is basically where you define your variables and body is just a list of expressions that is going to be evaluated in the environment of let it might be hard to follow uh, when i like kind of uh, phrase my sentences like this but if you see it in action action you'll get it in no time so a list of bindings 
each binding comes in a form of a list itself so two parentheses uh, let's say x is one and y is two right and then you can say message x message y right so oops sorry 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 I have so many um, key bindings in my uh, keyboard that I usually mess it up uh, using other key, uh, key bindings by mistake. Very, 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 yeah. So right now, this list that you can see here is the list of bindings. We're binding uh, the name x to value one and the name y to value two right and in the context of our let which is this scope here x and y have a value don't don't make them actually yeah i i think like i i tried i want to say something and all of a sudden i found that like a counter argument to that uh, anyway so in the in the body of let x is one and y is two as simple as that and outside of the let they're back to whatever value they had before so there are different variables when we're inside let and outside of let if they exist they have its their different values that's how we use uh, let to define local variables and since everything is an expression let has an uh, like evaluates to the final the, like the return value and the evaluation re result of let is the uh, evaluation result of the final form whatever it is right in this case it like whatever message y returns that would be the return value of let so if we uh oops, sorry message expects uh, strings not integers so if we evaluate this one we can see uh, in the message buffer that we got two bag one and two and two is the return value so that's how it works like that how let works but you might want to actually let make some changes here again let's use numbers again right and do for example x y right this thing obviously evaluate to three but what if you want to define a local variable that is like local binding i have to avoid using variable here they're just bindings right something like this right so we use the first binding that we defined in this uh, to define the second binding is it going to work no as you can see it says void variable x by default the default variant of let doesn't let you <laughs> doesn't let you to use any binding that you might define in the uh, list of bindings to define another binding right so since we defined x here we can't use it in y as well um but basically I might be wrong, but based on uh, like in my head, that's because it reads all the bindings first and then define everything. Uh, so by the point that we define Y, X is not defined yet, right? So in order to fix that, you either has to, um, sorry, again, so, <laughs> This is happening because I, I have a button on my keyboard that turns my keyboard to a mouse. Uh, I keep hitting it and it works like a mouse. Anyway, uh, in order to uh, overcome that issue, we have two options. Either use a nested less, let like this, right? And define X in here and uh, Y here, right? Uh, and finally like do what uh, write down whatever we want here as like in the inner let that's one option 
the other option which works the same but it's much nicer is to use another variant of let which is like i don't know how to pronounce it let a star let asterisk i don't know with a, like a little uh, asterisk beside it it's another special form uh form that works the same but let you to define uh to use the binding that you define in the same let uh, to define another binding so as you can see it works that was like a crash course on how to use let and why we discussed let because first of all we needed to create <clears throat> be, be able to define local variables local bindings and then the main <clears throat> the main purpose and the goal was to actually have multiple um expression in the then expression right so that's one way to define whatever we want here and basically we can have as many as expression as we want as the body of the let and use it as an expression the other way we can do it now that we know let the other way we can do it that you might see a lot in the uh, when you read the source code or uh, when you elist library is the prog family prog which the most common one is prog n i use it a lot what happens in prog n is it just evaluates every form as the body so it gets many uh sorry gets many expressions as the body as many as you want and it just ex uh, evaluates every one of them and the return value of this expression would be like any other uh, block of code the final uh, the evaluation result of the final expression so if we say one two three four um yeah let me do it this way so you get it this thing is going to evaluate to four easy so if we have a again we have a message here and i evaluate this one you can see in the message buffer that we got that weird uh, string and then number four so it evaluates every uh, expression and returns the evaluation result of the last one. It's just a way to group bunch of uh, expressions together for cases like if to use it as the if uh, then class, right? There's other variant of uh, prog as well, like prog1, prog2, uh, and things like that. Personally, I don't like them, but you can uh, find them in uh, many source code. For example, how prog and uh, prog one works is that it's going to evaluate everything uh, in the body, but it's going to return the evaluation result of the first expression as the uh, return value of prog one. So here we should expect number one, right? As you can see. Um, the reason why I don't like it is because in my eyes, simplicity is all about like having less rules and laws. If you have too many branching in your uh, whatever you're working on, uh, that's kind of breaks the simple like that. That makes it compl uh, more complicated. Uh, you know, whenever like right now I'm des uh, describing uh, Elis to you and to this point, in a block of code, the final expression, like the return value of the fi final expression was always uh, the return value of the entire block. But this thing like prog n is kind of breaks that uh, that rule, uh, which makes it more complicated. That's why I'm, I actually, I can't recall any time that I used prog uh, one or two or whatever, but it works like that. If you If you need it, you can use it or if you come, uh, come across it in another source code, you know how it works. So that's let and uh, proc family out of the way. And we learn about if going back to the slides from now on, it's super easy to uh, learn when and uh, unless are quite easy. They're special forms. Hmm, I, I, I'm not sure if when is a special form in case uh, in e list, but uh, we can see it uh, we can find out uh, easily 
So how it works is that it takes a condition and a body. If the condition uh, actually evaluates to a um, true C value, it's going to run the body. Easy, right? There's no else class. You can think of it basically as this is equivalent of this. Condition, prog, and whatever we want and it's literally uh, the same thing as this if here that's why i'm not sure whether or not when is a special form or a macro so if uh, let's figure it out actually let's see yeah it's a macro as i mentioned it's just a macro Ooh, and, and the definition is interesting um okay we can talk about macros in the future it's too soon but it's literally something like this if the condition is true run the body otherwise nil right so for example if we say when t and as the body we can again have one two three this thing in here and four as you can see, it returns number four. And if we go back to the message, we can see that we are the string again. So that's how when works. There's no else clause, easy. Um, I see it quite often. The people use it a lot. I use it a lot. And another one which quite uh, which is quite similar uh, is unless. But as the name suggests, the condition has to be nil. For the body to be run so uh, again it would be like condition and uh, body so two if the for when if the condition evaluates to nil it returns nil remember it would be like this and for unless it would be equivalent to this. All right, actually, it doesn't need plugin anymore because you can have many, many else expressions. So, actually, sorry, it should be something like this, right? So, as you can see, since the condition is uh, nil, it evaluates the body. And if the condition is true, it won't. It returns nil. Um, going back to the going back to the um, slides. So we talked about if, when, unless, and now it's time to talk about con. We have more. Um, we have more like many other conditionals in ELIST, but they're kind of different forms of uh, these four. And these are like the most important one you, you might see in any other, uh, any source code that you might read. So um, count is a little bit different than the other three. Uh, it works like this, like the form is like this. Uh, list of conditional right so keyword con or like special form con comes uh like after con comes a list of uh, conditional pairs let's see how it works so let's do this for example string b la and then message Ooh, what's wrong with me today message it is a string that's one pair another pair would be actually you know what let's do this uh nil and then say message it's nil so this is the first pair condition pair this is the second condition pair 
how it works is that it walks through all the pairs and evaluate the first um, element of the pair uh, to see whether or not as the condition basically if it's uh, true it, no if it's not false that's better it's better to say it that way if it's not false it's going to evaluate the second uh, element of the pair as the like yeah it's going to just evaluate it as the then class right if not move uh, to the next clause it's 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 very similar to a switch case from other programming languages right so as you can see here we on the not here on the sorry on the message buffer we can see that it's an string we printed out it's an string right so this expression got evaluated but this one didn't right it means that the nil like we try to con try to evaluate nil as a condition nil evaluates to nil so false it kind of escaped this pair came to this one uh a string p is a function is a type predicate function uh, i'm going to talk about it in, in a second but basically it says uh, is my parameter the only parameter is on a string or not in this case blah is on a string and can't actually evaluate this message here so what happens if we set this one to true let's see as you can see we only see it's nil and not it's a string as well while the second condition is true as well it kind of evaluates the very the very first condition that evaluates to a true c value right so if we have like n pairs here and all of them the condition of all all the pairs are true it's only going to evaluate the first then clause of the first uh like true condition um I, I think that like i didn't explain it very well it's kind of a uh, it might sound a little bit complicated at the moment but see like if we talk in terms of switch case think of every pair as a case right so the first element has to be the condition the second element uh, should be the expression that we want to raw, uh, to evaluate if the condition is not false so uh, this is a pair first element this is a second element right uh, this is another pair this is another pair uh, this one is the first element of the pair and this one is the second element right so we, we can have many conditions uh, let's have another one number e and what happens is like return sorry return five six so here we say uh is two uh, two three four a number if it is we want to evaluate number six right but again since the very first one is true that's the only one that is going to evaluate uh, uh, using uh, like count is going to evaluate only that one so if we to use nil here and do uh, yes number here and then evaluate it we get six back because the first uh, the condition of first pair is nil it's false the second uh, the first element which is the condition of the second pair is false as well so it falls to this one so very similar to a switch case and practically at the end we can say to uh, true and do a bunch of stuff in here as the default case right so we can like you see this pattern quite a lot while anything beside three works as well like number anything works in the same way but as a convention people use t so it means that Try this condition pair if it didn't work. Try this condition pair if it didn't work. Try this one, and finally, if no, none of above worked, uh, like was true. Sorry, 
if none of above was not false try this one right and since t is obviously not false this prog n is going to be uh, evaluated so this is count like it's quite useful you can uh, you see it in a lot of functions especially those recursive functions people love to use count i do at, at least so going back to the slides um, we have some functions to talk about like you know and not or eq and equal and so many other functions that you might use in uh, in terms of uh, uh, when you write your condition let's go over them really quick uh, starting from the easy one and so it takes many many as many as you want uh, parameters or arguments it's a special form in a way that it returns true if all the elements are have a, like a true value or better to say if all the value values are not false or nil right so Right now, it returns the final one uh, as the return value of AND, which obviously 4 is not nil, so that's true. If we have nil in here, it returns nil because one of them is nil. And the way it works, like other, like logic and other programming languages, it start evaluating from the very first element, move to the second one, move to the third one, and so on and so forth. Uh, so right here we should only see this string because since it reaches nil it just uh, ends the term like ends the evaluation process and it won't go to any further in the list right so this message here is not going to get evaluated right so if we go to the message buffer to the end as you can see we got only the first one right and we didn't get this one like any other uh but like how and works basically in any other languages or is uh you, you're familiar with it basically it's uh again takes many arguments if any of them is uh, has a like a truthy value it's going to return uh the true the truthy value otherwise it's going to return near so let's do this right number four that's true let's do this number four right it's going to if i'm not mistaken it's going to return the final the last truthy value no the first one sorry so how it works is it, it, it walks through the elements evaluate them and basically if it finds one truthy value that's it the return value of the of, of or would be a true value otherwise uh nil so if we remove these two obviously it's going to return nil um not is an obvious one whatever you give it it not like, like logic not set right not nil true and not anything true it's nil really obvious right uh, actually let, let me leave it here um what else we have in here oh eq and equal two important functions so we have two functions to check equality one is eq and the other one is equal uh while i think like the naming is a little bit confusing here while they sound the same they're not the same Basically, EQ check whether or not these two are the same object. And in my head, I like my view of the same object means same interpretation of a chunk, the same chunk in memory, right? Uh, so, for example, if we say something like this, right, it returns new. While obviously both arguments are the same string, like they're conceptually the same thing like we write them as with the same letters but since they are two different strings in memory they're not equal that's what eq stands like 
how it works basically but equal checks uh, for the semantics of uh, things rather than uh, like them being the same object so you see this one is nil but when we use equal it checks the semantics semantically both of them are the same same as string so it's true um we have some other functions like greater than less than and stuff like that for the numbers like i guess we have something like this as well i might be wrong i, I remember using it before to check the string quality yeah like there's like many functions but these two are the most important one um oh so uh type predicates as you, as you saw, I used uh, a string p. Uh, in Elise, we have some functions to check, uh, like they call type predicates, basically to check whether a given parameter is in a certain type or not, or in case of bound p, whether or not it bounds to a value, like a symbol is bound to a value or not. Like I. I um, added a link to all the type uh, predicates in Emacs list, but there's like a long list of type predicates, but usually, oh, by the way, the P at the end is the convention. When you see a P at the end, you kind of know that this thing, this function is a type predicate. That's how it works. That's a convention. But basically uh, they work quite like they're, pretty useful for example when we say string p some some string it returns true because the given thing is a string if we return number uh if we use number it returns false or a better example would be let's say x is an s string and we want to see whether x is an s string or not is a string or not True because x is a local binding uh, bound to an string bound to a string and the strings are strings obviously. Uh, we can do the same for numbers, number p, integers, so many things. Like obviously that's not a, a number. Um, what like? I hope I'm not mistaken. Window p. Yes, x is not a window. We talked about it. Like the concept of window in Emacs. Uh, and so many other things. One very useful thing to use is bound p. Bound p basically tells you whether or not, sorry, I have to quote it. Uh, bound p tells you, you, you can pass it a symbol and you have to quote the symbol because if you remember, uh, symbols evaluate to the value that they point to and by using this, if we, if I don't quote it, it, it x is going to re be replaced by this string here and that's not a good thing because bounty ex expected a symbol so if i do this it tries to figure out whether that uh, whether the symbol x is bound to a name bound to a value or not and in this case since we're inside of the let environment x is bound to this string so it's bounded no bounded it's bound um, but if we change it to y it's not bound anymore so in this environment x is not bound to anything uh, that's how bound works and uh, basically the purpose like i just wanted to you to know what type predicates are there's a, like a long list i included the link to the documentation you can uh, read it and uh, get familiar with like many of them um you see them in uh, like different source code different libraries that you might read uh, quite a lot so it's good to know about them and finally there's a function called type of when you say actually let's do it here say type of y it returns a string it tells you what's the type of the given parameter right let's say type of p integer type of nil 
symbol. That's really obvious. Um, yeah, uh, type typo works that way as well. So I I kind of uh, left one goodie uh, for the end. Um, you you might uh, come across something like this, right? You might come across something like this. You like this thing represent an empty uh, empty list as you can remember um we're coaching the list because we don't want it to be evaluated we want it as just a, like a plain list so you you might uh, run into this and you you would be like okay empty list obviously is not nil so i have to expect number one but when you evaluate it you get number three back and you panic and say, oh, what's wrong? Like, what's happening here? So one thing that you should know is that in Emacs list, empty, Jesus, empty list is exactly nil. There, you can replace them together, right? And you can use any of them. Empty list is actually nil. So there's a function called cons we learn about it in the in future probably next episode it it creates a, a it creates a cons right so if i say for example cons one two the return value on the bottom left as you can see is a cons with one and oops, sorry with one and two as elements one is the head two is the tail um ah but at the same time you if you see something like this you would be like "Ooh, what's that i should you in this case you would expect you would expect something like this um don't worry if you understand don't understand what this dot is for i'm going to talk about it in the future episode but when when you see something like this you would expect something like this but the fact is nil is just an empty list right and that cons there is exactly like doing this, right? So running this would be a list with only one, right? So do we have a nil p? I guess we do. No, we don't. Oh, that's not, it's called null. We have a function called null. We have a function called uh, null, which returns, uh, which takes one argument and returns true if the given argument is nil, otherwise it returns true. Null nil returns true, right? And if I do this, I get true as well, because empty list is true. Or if I do this, again true because this is how this is the constructor of list like that's how we create lists but if i put an element in it it's not nil anymore so that's uh, one thing to watch out for actually um i found it interesting uh, because empty lists and nil are the same and you know uh it's an an inter interesting way e list works i i don't know whether it's the same uh in other lists or not i have to check it but watch out for it uh you, you like it's quite simple so um that's it for today um i to be honest i thought it's going to be much shorter <laughs> but it wasn't uh what it turned out to be uh, longer than i expected this is Samir. If you like what I do, uh, please subscribe to the channel and leave a like. It, uh, it helps me a lot to uh, improve my content. And uh, hope to see you in the next episode. Have fun.